Coming up on the Louis Diaz podcast. While climbing Everest, you meet so many people. They have so many ideas and you just get inspired by the stories and you come up with new sto- new ideas and there's just possibilities are endless. Hello and welcome to the Louis Diaz podcast. Every day I come across some of the most incredibly fascinating and authentic people from all walks of life. And together, we're inviting you in to be our special guest as we take you through some of their amazing experiences, adventures, and journeys. So sit back, relax, and I hope you enjoy this episode of the Louis Diaz Podcast. Okay, I'm going to welcome Marta Mishdal, travel blogger from To Live to Travel, right? That's right. Welcome to the Louis Diaz Podcast. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, I was going through your blog and I went to the about section and there was a little bit that I read there. It's uh, If you don't mind me reading it. Go for it. I don't know when I updated that, so I'm not sure how accurate it is, but go for it. I haven't actually checked it. In I'm while. pretty sure this bit won't have changed um, okay. since you last <laughs> updated it. It says, my name is Marta and I come from a small town in Poland called Piwa. Growing up, I was raised by a single mum. I had a good, humble upbringing. I always loved the outdoors and hanging out with my friends. Has much changed? Nothing has changed, no. That still is the case, actually. I love the outdoors. I love hanging out with friends. Anything outdoors is, is my kind of um, ideal place to be. It seems like your recollections of your upbringing in Pia and when you wrote that little piece for your About section, you seem to have really ramped up your sort of goals that you've set for for your travels and and what you want to do tell everyone a little bit about kind of what is to live to travel what do you do what inspires you and um yeah we'll go from there so well to live to travel is obviously my social media platform or well, not, it's not just one platform it's not just one blog it's it's i don't know facebook instagram tiktok everything is to live to travel this is the name i created some time ago and i just go by that but basically what what i'm doing there i'm sharing my experience so years ago when i started traveling which kind of started when i moved to the uk i traveled a lot uh, given that I was uh, a full-time worker, I think I travel more than an, an average person. And my family all, always wanted to see my photos, hear my stories, and they always kind of encouraged me to start writing the blog, mainly for them. And after a few years, I kind of met a few people doing that already, and I thought, well, why don't I do it? I probably travel even more than those people that I met that were doing it. Why don't I do it as well? So this is how it started. I started sharing it on social media. I started writing a little bit. Um, Not too much, to be honest. Probably most of my trips and my uh, outdoorsy activities, they are shared sort of in a visual way. So obviously photos and videos and stories, uh, like little stories on whether it's TikTok or or Instagram. But I I am, yeah, I'm, I'm writing a blog as well. And um, it became like a platform to encourage other people to do the same. Because I think a lot of people would want to do what I do, but they just have no either motivation and they, or they don't know how to start or where to go. And I feel like a lot of my friends have always been asking me, oh, how do you get time for that? How do you find this? How do you organize that? And I feel like I can share that knowledge with others to help others have similar lifestyle. Yeah, I like that. So it's kind of sharing by doing and leading by example, I guess you could say. Yeah, I hope I am leading by example, yeah. To me, it seems as though um, some of the goals that you set for yourself aren't your ordinary everyday kind of goals. They don't seem like the kind of goals that people that want to just travel and get away on the weekend usually set themselves. What is it that sort of motivates you at the moment? So when I was younger, I was just traveling and then it became almost, I don't want to say boring, but it just kind of lacked something. So I wanted a little bit more than just traveling. I wanted to achieve something and I wanted, I'm I'm very much a box ticker. Unfortunately, it's criticized by some, but it is what it is. This is me. I do like ticking boxes and I do like going through some sort of a list I've done, you know, I did a skydive, sky, what is it, bungee jumping, skydiving. I did, I don't know, wide water rafting, kite surfing, things like that. 
and it it somehow is exciting for me and it's very addictive as well so basically i started looking for adventures that gave me that sort of buzz as opposed to just going to another country i wasn't enough excited already going to a country i've never been unless there was something that i haven't done at the same time so hiking became my prime goal of looking for places to go so about nine years ago now uh, i went to peru i went on my own i joined a group well half of the trip was with the group the other half of the trip i was completely on my own and I did Inca Trail, which is obviously very popular hiking uh, trail. Um, and I absolutely loved it. It was a four day hike. You sleep in a tent, you go through the Peruvian Andes. It's absolutely stunning, beautiful. And that was my probably first small, most serious adventure, if I can say that. And I was really curious what it's like to go higher and do a little bit more, even more difficult adventure. And so soon after that, I signed up for Kilimanjaro. And that that's how my whole sort of hiking slash mountain climbing career started. Not career, but you know, like a big journey. So I guess it, it's sort of one thing led to another. It started snowballing. I found it interesting that you said you, you're a bit of a box ticker and that that's criticized by some people, right? Because what is the right way to do life? Uh, is there a right way? And I think if I'm not mistaken, I think most people in life would really agree that one of the finest ways to live from the moment you're born to the moment that you leave the earth is to enrich your experience as much as possible, right? And if for some people it means that they make a list and they tick that off, then I don't see any any kind of issue with that. Absolutely. I totally agree. At the end of the day, it's about what makes you happy. If for some people going through a list of things to do makes them happy, and that is definitely me, then why not? For others, going to the same destination in Spain, because that destination is so beautiful, and they go back every year to the same place, and that makes them happy, that's that's fine as well and so we have to just accept that everyone's different yeah i find that pretty interesting and i really admire your your journey so far and what you've been able to do and create and the community that sort of follows you and and what you do but i'm interested i want to go back to you know what happened after sort of inca and then kilimanjaro right because there's got to be something there i'm also interested to sort of let people know you know, you've, you've set yourself a pretty high goal. So, uh, so first of all, I want to climb seven summits, which is the highest mountain on each of the seven continents. I have done six already. I've got one left and that is Carson's Pyramid. And I know you are based in Australia and I know Kosciuszko is the highest one in Australia, but most of the people, most, not all, but most of the people, uh, don't consider that as um, the highest one in Australia. They count Australia and surrounding islands as one continent. So for that reason, the highest one in Australia and the islands would be Carson's Pyramid, which is in Indonesia. So that's the last one I've got. I will do Kosciuszko as well, just to take another box. But in my goal, there is obviously um, Carson Pyramid. So that's the last one to do seven summits. And then at the same time, I'm also doing the crown of Europe, which is the highest mountain in each European country. So there is um, there are 50 countries in Europe that I count because there's obviously the definition of the country is not always the same. Uh, so I count 50 countries and 48 peaks because a couple of countries will have one peak in between them. Um, So 48 peaks to do. I have done 23 already and I'm hoping to finish all of them within the next two years maybe. And if I do both of these challenges, uh, which is Seven Summits and the Crown of Europe, I would be the first person in the world to do it because you either have mountaineers or you've got hikers, but you don't really get both. So I'm hoping I will be the first person, but obviously I still have a quite a big 
list of those things to do. So um, we'll see how it goes, but it's definitely something that I'm aiming for. Okay, that's a huge goal. Uh, and that's very impressive. And honestly, just kind of, I'm a visual person. So while you talk, I sort of start thinking about all the peaks and, you know, some of the climbing and walking. And it's kind of exhausting to even just think about not only that, but you, you've, you've got a full-time job as well. So you're fitting all this around, you know, having a regular life, right? That's true. It's, it's not easy, I'm not going to lie. My life is super, super busy. But I kind of found a way to cope with that. So I think a lot of the people will think that all I do is hike and mountain climb and there's no social life and things like that but you can combine those things so for for example most of my social interactions happen on the mountain so for example today i'm going on a weekend hike and i'm going with my friends so i organize a trip because i want to go and i bring my friends along so we're going to have the entire weekend to spend socialize we're obviously going to go for a drink afterwards and that's enough for me. I don't need to go to central London every Friday to, to meet with them because I will meet them somewhere on the mountain. And they very much want to join trips like that because I think people do want to be active and they do want to go outdoors. They just very often don't know where or how or they have no friends that would go with them or they may be too lazy to organize it so i am the organizer and i was tag bring people along so you can combine those two things yeah yeah absolutely i mean again a little bit off the regular everyday kind of thing that people do right you, like you said central london's an option to catch up with your friends and but it's not outdoors right and it's not doing something you love so why not combine both Exactly. Another thing is people that want to stay fit, they will go to the gym every day. And yes, I do that as well. But a lot of my gym session I could replace with just going hiking. I will take a heavier backpack. My friends will come just for a social part of it. And I will be struggling with my heavy backpack. And that's going to be my training. So again, I can save time not going to the gym because instead I'll go socializing with my friends with a heavy backpack and I combine the two. Likewise, I when I go to work, I it takes me about an hour to get to work. And you would think that it's a time wasted. You can also make that, turn that into kind of a training. So when I trained for Denali, uh, Denali is the highest mountain in North America, and you have to carry a lot of weight. So I had to carry 60 kilograms, which is more than my body weight. So half of it you carry in a backpack, the other half you carry on a sled, you pull up the mountain. And I had to train carrying heavy loads. So what I did, I would fill up my backpack with 30 liters of water. And every day when I go to work, I would jump on the train and I would be, instead of sitting, I'll be standing with my heavy backpack. It was really hard but that way every day one hour coming to work i'm with a backpack and on the way back i'm another one hour with a backpack that's two hours of some sort of training or i sometimes run to work uh, or from work that's half a marathon and yes i will take two hours to run it but you know it's only one hour extra on top of my commuting so i get to spend two, one hour on top of my commuting but I get to run half a marathon in a day so you can combine those things and that will help you save a lot of time so yeah it's possible mm. well wow. you're you're definitely you know we haven't really spoken we spoke a little bit last night but you know this is our first time chatting and I don't like to do a lot of research on people before catching up because I feel like it can ruin some of the spontaneity in the conversation right uh, but right now, you're coming across to me like you're very, very driven. And more than the average person, it's fair to say, and I'm sure our listeners would agree. Um, but like, I'm fascinated, right? Because I'm sitting here, you're talking, and all I'm sitting here thinking is like, my, one of my eyebrows is raised. And not out of skepticism, I'm like thinking, she's some kind of superwoman. This, sound, this sounds unreal. Like, I'm not going to lie. I don't think I can walk around with 30 kilos on my back, right? Um, and that's less than my body weight. Um, but then, you know, while you're talking, I'm also sitting there thinking, there was a reason why you 
mentioned in your blog that you were raised by a single mother, right? There's some kind of element of pride there for you. Yeah, no, absolutely. My mom is the best human being. I mean, what she did for me and my brother, she had two kids and we were both both same age pretty much. So my dad left when I was three. My brother was four at the time. So she had to look after two little babies and she worked her ass off to make sure that we had what to eat and we had clothes and we were poor. We didn't, I never had money for like food at school. Like I had to bring my own sandwiches. Every, every kid in school will have like crisps and little chocolate. I didn't have money for that. I couldn't, I had to just like sit and watch them. So I, I always, since I was a little girl, I had to kind of find my own space and find my own kind of a cheap way of enjoying that life. So I found that outdoorsy thing was free. And so I was always out just playing and that was fun as well. I didn't have, I didn't need money for that. But a lot of my friends could afford having computer games, that some of them would play tennis or things like that. I couldn't afford that. All I had is my little ball and I can go out and play a ball. And that was cheap. That was free. Mm. Let me ask you, did you get a little bit emotional when you think about your upbringing or is it mostly pride? Um, I wouldn't say emotional. Uh, I think I am... I don't know if it's if pride is the right word. I think I think it explains a lot why I am the way I am. And I'm definitely proud of my mom what she did because my mom, you know, living in Poland is not easy as in some countries. Obviously there are countries that life is even harder than Poland absolutely. But I compare for example Poland to the UK and my mom, she's got a master degree in economics. You would think that she will have a top job somewhere, but that was not the reality when I was a child. She was a cleaner for some time, and I do remember this. And, you know, imagine a single mom as a cleaner. We couldn't afford pretty much anything. And it's not, it wasn't easy. But so I am proud of my mom, what she, you know, how hard she worked. She had a full time job. And then she had another part-time job in in the evening. So she was there just to provide for us. And she was always putting so much pressure on us, not pressure, but like encouraging us to work hard, me and my brother, because she always said that this is the only way that can make you succeed. And, you know, you can't rely on others. You can only rely on yourself. And with hard work, you're going to get where you want to get. And I think I got it from my mom for sure. You know, it's, it kind of makes me, it, it does make me feel a little emotional when I hear people talk about their mums and how, how you know, their parents motivated them. And there's something about family that makes us who we are. And sometimes when we're out there in the world doing what we do, we tend to forget. But it's only upon like reflecting that we're like, yeah, I got this straight from my mum or my grandma or my dad or someone. And, you know, it's really beautiful to hear those stories. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, our childhood and our relationship with with our parents is definitely something that shapes us. So even my father, you know, he left when I was three years old. I am not in touch with my father anymore, uh, but I was when I was a child. He definitely was the one who encouraged me to be outdoorsy and to be very spontaneous and very sort of loving the nature. He took us to Polish mountains many times, me and my brother. My mom was more a person who worked hard. She liked staying at home. So she was the complete opposite, but she definitely taught me how, you know, how important it is to work hard. But my dad definitely taught me how amazing it is to be outdoors and how to be, how amazing it is to be adventurous. Amazing. So I guess you've given the audience a really great picture of, you know, what's made you so motivated. What What are you drinking there? I've got a tea, sorry. I'm such a tea drinker. Even in the summer, I drink hot tea. I don't know why. I just got so much into tea that, yeah, sorry. That's okay. I love it. Um, What kind of tea? Green tea. Okay. It's good for you, right? Apparently so. But I think there is a limit how much you should drink because I drink a lot of it. I don't think you've reached that limit yet somehow. So just keep going. Hopefully not. (laughs) Um, so yeah, I mean, like I was saying, you have given the audience a really great picture of what makes you so driven, right? You've talked about 
quite a few things like your mum, your upbringing, the, your love of the outdoors, beginning with your father introducing you to, to outdoors. And you've also talked a little bit about you wanting to enrich your experience in life as much as possible by doing as many things as you possibly can and sharing them with other people, which is amazing. But you started somewhere and that was Inca Trail. And then you went to Kilimanjaro. And then we, was it just addictive after that or did you need to take a break and rethink this whole no, thing? No, it's, it's very addictive. I think reaching the summit is something I can't even describe it, especially that if it's a summit that you know you're going to achieve in it anyway, it's not as emotional. But if you're not sure you're going to make it and then you do actually end up making it to the top, it's just the best experience ever. It's, it's, it's the sense of achievement is incredible and it is addictive. So this is what started my addiction. And, you know, I discovered how amazing it is to, to reach the summit. When I was on top of Kilimanjaro, I didn't think I could make it. I, to be honest, on the, the summit day, it was so hard and I didn't do very well. I remember the exact thought we were going for the summit and it was so hard. I had a massive headache. And I was thinking, oh, my God, people actually climb Everest. How do they do that? I remember this thought so vividly that I, I thought there's no way I would ever climb Everest. That's just not me. I'm not created for it. And I actually thought I will never go and climb another mountain. But the moment you reach the summit, you forget about the pain and the joy and the positive energy you get from, from that just outweighs all the pain that you've gone through. So as soon as I got back from Kilimanjaro, I thought, okay, what's next? I want another mountain. And the next one was Mont Blanc. And I was thinking about it for about two weeks. I really wanted to sign up and I thought... Shall I go for Mont, Mont, uh, Mont Blanc or not? Because I know it's a little bit more technical mountain. And obviously at the time, that was a big deal for me. You know, I didn't have any technical experience. And I didn't know whether I would be able to do it. Am I like too amateur for that, to not fit? And it took me about two weeks to think about it. And then I thought, you know what? I'm just going to try it. I mean, what's going to happen? Worst case, I'm just going to turn back and and not make it come back and just at least I tried you know I won't regret in the future so I did but I reached the summit even though there were six of us three people didn't make it three strong men didn't make it the other two strong also strong men made it and I was the I was the weakest physically uh in the group there's no doubt but I was probably strongest mentally and so yeah I made it to the top and that's you know another thing to tick off of my list and I just wanted more and more because it's really addictive. Mm, yeah, I got the Superwoman vibes there again, by the way. Um, but also... By, by the way, do you, you do realise I'm absolutely not. And this is a very common misconception. People hear my story and they hear about me climbing some mountains whether it's Denali or Everest, I'm actually just five foot three. I don't know whether you use foot or it's 162 centimeters. And I'm I'm relatively petite person and I'm not an athlete and I'm not a super strong or super fast person. I'm just keen and I'm not afraid to try. That's the only difference. Even that, even you just saying that is super womanish, right? Uh, there's something... There's something about just the way that you describe yourself and yes, you're keen and you're determined. I'm interested though, there's a, there's one thing that you said there. There's a couple of things that you said actually. The first one was the way that you described Kilimanjaro, right? The way that you described sort of getting through that experience and then reaching the summit and forgetting all about the pain. Literally while you were talking, I was like, I've heard this before. I've heard this exact, almost the exact thing before I've almost seen this exact thing before when I was watching childbirth, which is just wild because everything you said could have absolutely related to, to childbirth, right? Uh, yeah, I can only imagine. I don't have any kids, yeah, so I can't tell you. But yeah. I can only imagine. It's wild. It's like when my daughter was born, suddenly my partner at the time who had been in labor for, must have been like 10 hours or something by then, uh, and had been in excruciating pain, as soon as 
um, you know, we lifted her out of the water because we, we had a water birth. It's kind of like the pain just disappeared from her face and just this smile and this ecstatic elation just sort of appeared. And it just, you, you just talking about Kilimanjaro took me back to that spot, which was just incredible, right? And also your determination must be really strong as well. I mean, you said six people tried to climb Mount Blanc, Mont Blanc and three dropped out. That must do something to someone when they see their peers dropping out. Like, you know, as soon as the first person goes, it's almost like you've got an excuse to be the next one that goes and, you know, it's hard. So it's okay. I'll forgive myself. Do you ever sort of feel that or do you become more determined? What happens in your head? I just never understand that the reason why someone gives up. Obviously, unless there is some medical issue, then it's understandable. But if someone just gives up, I can't understand this. So first two guys dropped out together. So we were going for the summit. Not yet for the summit, but we were going. So first you acclimatize, you climb another mountain to to train a little bit, to acclimatize, and then you're going for Mont Blanc. So we started going for Mont Blanc at night. And all of a sudden, after a couple of hours, they were like, two of them, they were like, we're not going anymore. We're not feeling safe. And I just couldn't understand that. I don't know what the expectations were. I knew it's going to be dark. I knew it's going to be cold. I knew it's going to be hard. And as long as you know this, why do you give up? Unless they didn't know that. But I couldn't understand why they would give up. And it wasn't that it made me doubt whether I should carry on. I I just completely, I don't want to say ignored it. I couldn't understand that. But I didn't, like, for a second thought, okay, maybe I shouldn't go. I did have once a situation where I actually doubted myself. That was when I climbed the highest one in South America, Concagua. There was four of us in a group three strong men and myself. So usually I'm the only girl, but, um, there was, so there was four of us. So two of the men, there were like six foot at least. And after a couple of weeks of hiking slash climbing, whatever, they decided that they don't want to carry their bags anymore because it's too heavy. And, they hired porters. And now in Aconcagua, it's not normal to hire porters. So you usually carry your stuff yourself. And it's a possibility, but obviously it costs an absolute fortune because it's not something that is there for you available. So they were like, right, we are done. We're not going to carry anymore. We're hiring porters. They spent the fortune to do that. And I thought, okay, well, if they're doing it and they are six foot, I'm only five three. And there's no way that I'm stronger than them. So maybe I should give up as well. And I do remember my guide then said, no, don't do it. You'll make it. And he was just constantly, like very believing in me and just kept saying, don't do it. You, you're going to make it. You're going to make it. And so in the end, I got persuaded and I didn't do it. So I carried my stuff myself. And yeah, we all reached the summit. I reached without the help of porters. And those two men, they, they reached the summit as well. But, you know, they needed a little bit of help, even though there's absolutely no questions about it, that they were stronger than me. But it did make me doubt for a second. I didn't doubt that. I knew I'm going to carry on anyway. But I did think whether I should get some help or not, physical help. Okay, so... Do you think you've got a point to prove when you're out there with guys climbing? Is that how you feel? No, not really. I think occasionally, yes, there are some people that are a bit funny with women. But I think most of the people on the mountain are actually quite good, I would say. It's more probably the world outside of the mountains that would question me and and maybe judge me but not the climbing community. I think a big chunk of that community is actually quite good. So I haven't actually come across too much of that sort of sex discrimination. Let me ask you, do people look at you like a bit of a role model in some ways? Well, it would be amazing if that was the case. It's so flattering to know this, if that is the case sometimes. And I do hear that. On my social media, I don't know how much truth is in it, but it's definitely something that makes me happy. 
because I would want to be a role model to someone, especially um, younger women, to show them. I could. I hope I can show them that they can do what I do. They can follow the dream. It's not just climbing mountains. It's really any dream that young girls may have. I'm. I hope I can somehow show them that with hard work, determination, and the right mindset, they can do it too. Mm, yeah, I mean. Y- like you said, it's not just climbing mountains, right? What you do is far beyond that. You're pushing mental and physical barriers uh, and you're reaching your goals in doing so. That's, you know, take the mountains and the hiking trails out of that. That's special. It doesn't matter whether it's in business or dance or sport or recreation. You know, I feel like whenever someone puts themselves in that position to break through these mental barriers and do things that you know are really hard and maybe they didn't think that they could do or they were unsure it's really powerful yeah no absolutely you do learn a lot of resilience and you do learn that the only really thing that stops you from achieving your goal and as you say not just mountain climbing goal it could be a career goal or I don't know what else you might think of. The only thing that really stops you is your mindset. You know, I think a lot of people are scared that they're going to fail. I think that a lot of people are scared of the unknown. And and you learn that it's not really that scary. If you fail, it's so what? It's not really a failure. It's the experience. It's something that you can, you know, it's, it's the opportunity to learn about yourself and how can you improve things about yourself? So if you succeed, you pretty much didn't learn anything. But if you fail, that's when you learn the most. And the more challenges like this you take on, the more you learn about yourself, about how to cope with difficult situations. And you're just braver, more resilient. Mm, I love that. I think you just said that when you succeed, you don't learn anything. You learn the most when you fail. I really like that way of looking at things. It, it puts a lot of value on failures or it puts a lot of value on things not turning out the way that we hoped that they would turn out because, you know, there's something to be gained in, in that moment from that experience itself. Yeah, no, absolutely. Mm. Yeah, so you did the Inca Trail and then Kilimanjaro, Mont Blanc and then... And then I did Elbrus, the highest one in uh, Europe. So some people think that Mont Blanc is the highest one, but it's actually not. Mont Blanc is the highest one in Western Europe, but the highest mountain in Europe is actually uh, Elbrus, which is in uh, Russia. Which is probably a, a whole other wild adventure. I'm trying to get get us to you know that point when you were doing Kilimanjaro and you thought, how the hell do people climb Everest? to the moment that you said, I'm going to go and do that? So I think Elbrus was actually the first time I allowed myself that thought. It wasn't a plan yet. I just allowed myself to kind of dream for a few seconds in my head. And the reason was there was 14 of us in a group, two girls and 12 men. And I think I did pretty well. And I was very keen I probably trained a little bit more as well, and I thought I did well. And at the same time, on Elbrus, we were giving some training, and I was so keen to ask questions and try things, probably more than most of the people in the group, and our guides liked it. And obviously, I wanted to learn because I thought my safety is important, and learning those things can really save my life potentially in fact two people died before i got to the mountain and one of them is a friend of my friend just coincidentally so i knew the mountain is serious and i knew i want to do anything i can to stay safe so i was asking a lot of questions i was keen to learn And my guides recognized that. And when we summited, one of my guides who climbed Everest three times, he said he can see me climbing Everest because he says that I've got uh, the right attitude. And that was such a compliment. And also I thought for a second, wow, that would be amazing. What if 
because I, I was always very close to that thought of climbing Mount, uh, at Mount Everest because being from Poland, we always watched our Polish mountaineers climbing. Um, climbing a mountain for, for Polish communities is a huge thing. So I don't know if you know this, but uh, you've got 14 peaks above 8,000 meters uh, in, in the world. And out of 14 of them, 10 of them were first conquered in winter by Polish people, which is a lot. So we were exposed to mountaineering in the media since we were kids. And so it was always fascination for me. It wasn't a plan. It wasn't a dream because that just was so remote, so unachievable. But it was definitely a big topic um for me and for many other parish people and so i didn't plan before to climb everest but for the first time when i was on Alberts, when this guy said that i he sees me uh, climbing everest that was the first time i thought oh my god what if and then what if turned into more training and a, a plan of some sort i guess N- not yet a plan i just thought i always still think that you have to take one step at a time And I think if someone out there likes outdoors and would like to climb Everest, they might see it as a massive step between where they are now, for example, if they're just starting versus Everest. It's a huge gap, but a lot of people don't realize that there's thousands of little steps in between. And I very much support the idea that you have to take one step at a time. You can't just jump jump from zero to Everest because it's overwhelming and it's dangerous, but it's also very overwhelming. But if you take one step at a time, you climb higher and higher and higher a mountain or more difficult mountain, that gap becomes smaller and smaller. So after Elbrus, I was I was planning to do a next mountain more difficult, which was Aconcagua. And I planned that and I thought I will take one step at a time, but I will not plan any other mountain past that. I kind of knew what would happen if I did summit all those mountains, but I didn't plan for it, if that makes sense. Yeah, of course. I mean, you need to... uh, It makes sense. It makes a lot of sense, actually. You make a lot of sense, all right? You don't just go from zero to Everest, I think were your exact words. And I guess that means there's, you know, from that moment where you're thinking like, what if there's some simmering that happens in your mind, you know, it's like simmering for a while. And I want to know how long it took for you to sort of go, I'm going to do this. Well, you're probably expecting me to say that soon after I climb the next mountain, but absolutely no. So when I climbed Aconcagua, I did not, I knew after Aconcagua would be Denali as the next one, but I did not allow myself to dream and think about this. I just knew I'm going to start planning if I climb Aconcagua. And I, I never wanted to be very overconfident. I know a lot of people say that, yeah, you have to go for it. You're going to make it. Somehow that never worked for me. Uh, I don't know whether it's because it was just too much pressure. And I didn't like that approach. I kind of always thought, I will try and I will do my absolute best. Whatever happens, if I don't make it, I will learn something from it. I will adjust and I'll try again. But I I never went to a mountain saying, I'm going to do it. So I think I was always, I don't think it's a lack. It probably is something to do with the confidence but it's also I think recognizing that no summit is ever guaranteed and even the stronger the strongest person in the world cannot guarantee the summit because you don't know what's going to happen there's so many things that are outside of your control it is the weather there's just pure lack there's your health you might just not feeling well at that time so I don't think you you can assume that yes, I'm going for it and I'm going to make it. So that never works, worked for me, even though, yes, a lot of people say that you have to think positively. I think I do think positively, but in a different spin, if that makes sense. So I always go thinking, I don't know whether I'm going to reach the summit, but I'm definitely going to give it absolutely everything I've got to make it. 
So after Aconcagua, as soon as I reached the summit, I started planning Denali because that's the next one sort of on the list. Uh, although Vincent, the highest one in Antarctica, is easier, but Vincent is very hard uh, to get to. So financially, that's a huge commitment. Climbing Vincent in Antarctica costs a fortune, same as Everest. It costs a fortune. It's a big, big commitment and big changes it requires to make in your life to do it unless obviously you're rich but that was never my not the case in my case and so yeah so that's why after I there was Denali and I started planning Denali just as, as soon as I got back from Aconcagua and when I climbed Denali then I started planning Vincent and I thought okay how am I gonna get that much money because it's so expensive so I obviously have to adjust my life to make it happen. And I knew that Finson will be relatively achievable once I get enough money to even go there. I knew it will be achievable if the weather permits. And I knew I'm going to go for Everest if I climb to the top. But I still didn't kind of talk about it openly. I just knew it in my head. I'm still listening. I'm just... Um... <laughs> I'm kind of in awe at the moment and, and it's not because I'm trying to be cheesy or, you know, like just flatter you with, with compliments, which I'm sure you get a lot from the general community, but it really is like what I think is like it takes for some people getting out of bed in the morning is, is a courage, right? Um, for some people in their life, you know, <laughs> that's what courage looks like. It looks like getting out of bed and going to work and facing the day it's not you know how am i going to adjust my life so i can climb the highest peak in antarctica that kind of courage is a little bit beyond i guess anything that i've actually even imagined and also maybe a lot of the listeners that have been listening to the previous episodes have le- have heard some really amazing stories really incredible stories that have taken so much courage to sort of live through but yet, I think you're just taking us to another level right now. That's how I feel. Yeah, no, fair. And I mean, my life was, uh, yeah, completely. I don't want to say it was changed. I think my life, I've always been living a very humble life because I had those dreams of traveling and doing those adventurous things. It's not just Mount Everest. So I've always been living below my sort of affordable standard of, standard of living, if that makes sense. I mean, even the fact that probably this is the one example that a lot of people find it sh- shocking. I'm obviously a girl and I like looking good and I like, I would like to look, look after myself, but it costs so much money. And last year I went to a hairdresser and my hairdresser asked me when, I, when was the last time I went to a hairdresser. It was 23 years ago, that was the answer. So when you think about this, for 23 years, for a girl not to, for a girl that look, liked to look after herself, not to go to a hairdresser, it's because I had other priorities. It's not because I don't like going to a hairdresser. I think it's an amazing experience to go to a hairdresser, but I would rather spend that money somewhere else. I got a lot more than I bargained for with this, with this chat. I mean, that's... So how did you cut your hair? And you just get friends to cut I it? I cut it myself. Yeah, just in the you go, you, No, you go to YouTube and you find out. I don't just dye, I don't just cut my hair. I also dye my hair. I'm really grey, actually. So I've been dyeing my hair for the last probably, I don't know, 10 years. It looks so great. I dye my hair. Well, thank you. Well, it's I'm not sure. that great, but... <laughs> it looks great. People will go onto your social media after this and see that you actually have great hair and be very impressed that you're able to do that yourself i'm sure thank you and so where are we we're at denali all right is that where we went after concagua denali yes and so you're building and building building on the scale of zero to everest you're you're not at zero anymore how close are you to everest now so a lot of the companies would say well if you've got a concagua and denali that means you might have a potential for Everest. That's kind of a common thing you hear from a lot of companies because Aconcagua is very high, it's almost 7,000 meters, and Denali is very cold and physically demanding. In fact, 
Climbing the summit, just the summit day on Denali, for me was harder than the summit day on Everest. And I heard that before. Uh, a lot of girls seems to think that. Maybe because on Denali you just have to carry so much stuff. There's no porters on uh, Everest. You've got Sherpas that help, whereas there's, there's no such thing as a, as a porter on Denali. So you have to carry everything yourself. And obviously... For a girl carrying 60 kilos versus for a big bloke, six foot four, carrying 60 kilos, it's, it's a big difference. Let's be absolutely honest about this, right? And we all just, we have to carry the same amount. We carry our personal belongings. We carry the group uh, food and uh, equipment, tents and everything. And there is no such thing as, oh, I'm a woman, so I'm going to carry less. No, we split equally. Everyone carries the same amount. So for me, 60 kilo is probably a much bigger deal than for a bloke who's six foot four. So it, that's why probably a lot of women find an alley harder than... Well, I don't want to say the whole experience was harder. Everest was way harder as a whole. But the summit day somehow was easier for me on Everest than the summit day on Denali. You talked a little bit about your sort of training regimes and the intensity of training started to pick up somewhere around about, you know, your Russian climb. Elbrus, yeah. So talk to me a little bit about the training side of it and then the kind of training that you, you needed to do for Everest then. So I think the really probably hardcore training started when I started getting ready for Denali because I knew Denali is going to be really hard physically and then that continued for Everest as well so I did I did Everest twice actually well sorry not, first time I didn't actually summit it but I went to climb Everest first time and then we had to cancel the expedition after two months because of COVID and other things but that obviously gave me the experience of, okay, what it's like to climb Everest. So I know now how to adjust my training. So I had to focus on a few things. So physical, obviously, physical part, it's, obviously, it's kind of an the obvious thing. So I had to train for endurance, strength and cardio. I noticed from previous climbs, the cardio was always the hardest thing for me. So I needed to focus on that the most. But also, um, I mean, climbing a mountain, it's not really physical as much as it is mental. And I was, I think, strong mentally, but I kind of thought I have to get ready mentally still even more so, right? So before Everest, I did a lot of things that are probably not very common things to do so for example i wanted to hike the longest distance i can hike ever in a day so i decided to hike 50 miles which is 82 kilometers or something like that and i did it in one day and i had tears in my eyes at the end because it was so painful my joints my hips my my ankles my my knees it was really painful and i was even on painkillers to, to complete the 50 mile walk or not walk it was a hike so you kind of go up and down a little bit so I knew if I do 50 miles in a day if someone now tells me well tomorrow we're gonna go 20 kilometers I know I knew this is not gonna be a big deal for me it, I'm not gonna be focusing on oh my god 20 kilometers I have to do how am I gonna do this I'm gonna focus on things that I cannot control or things that are really challenging but I'm never gonna focus on the distance because I know I can do 50 miles in one day I also did once a climb the height of Mont Blanc on a little hill so I was going up and down the hill and I did almost 5,000 meters on that over one weekend so again, I knew if, if we have to move between camps and someone says, well, we have to go 1,000 meters today, I knew it's not going to be an issue for me because I can do almost 5,000 in a day, in, in two days, sorry. So I can focus on other things that I cannot control or things that are harder for me, but I'm never going to be like overwhelmed by the height I need to do in a day. And then I also did, um, I don't know if you heard of thing like, it's called ever resting. So Everesting is basically you climb the height of Everest on either, again, on a little hill or a little stairs. So I did it on stairs. And that is so mentally exhausting, honestly. It's, it's really hard. I mean, it's not physically hard at all. Everyone can climb almost 9,000 meters in a few days, 
but imagine doing it on little stairs. I had to go, I think, one one thousand six hundred times up and down. It's really, really hard mentally. And that's where you train your mental strength. And you need to do that. Well, you don't need to do that. I decided I'm going to do it because I knew if I can deal with that monotony, I can deal with other things on Everest. So I can then focus. I don't have to be overwhelmed with what Everest brings me. I can focus on other things that I cannot train. Because obviously you can't train everything, right? Right. So you train things that you can and then you don't have to be overwhelmed by those things and you can focus on other things, if that makes sense. Well, it totally makes or, sense. So another thing I did, which was also very unusual, I asked my local council to give me a wheelie bin, clean one, <laughs> and I filled up with the water and obviously during winter that froze. And every, after every run, I would just jump into the cold bucket of water. I hate cold and I hated doing this. But I knew that this is going to be helping me overcome the fear of being cold. And, you know, it's, it's another opportunity to step outside of your comfort zone. And, and you train that way, if that makes sense. Or oh, there's another thing I did. Sorry, I'll just give you all those examples. So somehow climbing at night, I found sometimes might be overwhelming because it's dark, you don't know what's happening. I quite like climbing on Antarctica and Denali because at the time when we were climbing, there's no night. So it's always bright. So it's kind of nicer mentally, if that makes sense. Mm. Whereas when it's dark, it's a little bit more scary and, you know, you're kind of inside demons, uh, you know, not helping. Mm. So I decided I'm going to try to replicate the summit day. So I went on a cross trainer the entire night just to kind of get the sense of what it's going to be like at night because obviously you climb at night most of the time because it's the safest part of the day. Everything is frozen and it's easiest as well. So there was a lot of things that I had to do that were quite unusual on top of the normal physical exercises I had to do. Yeah, wow. And so let me ask, is your intuition guiding you into these certain exercises or is this advice that you're getting from somewhere? I think I've been reading and following so many people that a lot of those things become obvious and some of these things you can come up with yourself. For example, I bought a rope and I put a rope all like around my house and I I thought okay I'm gonna wake up in the middle of the night I'm gonna put big, big mittens on and I'm gonna clip to that rope with my juma juma is like a climbing device to go up so we don't fall down uh, and it's really hard to kind of handle that if you have big mittens on especially when you're like half asleep so that was probably something I made up I, I don't know if you know it's probably people do that but you have to have like a muscle memory that like, okay it's the middle of the night I'm half asleep I can't see anything I've got big mittens on and I still have to clip in clip out how am I going to train that well I'm going to just wake up and I do it at home so that's definitely something that helped me and that probably is something I came up with but but again when you are in that environment and that mindset of yeah i'm gonna climb those mountains then you, you probably follow a lot of people like this and you talk to a lot of people and they come up with some ideas and a lot of those things are just like kind of common sense they might be new to you but a lot of those things were not really new to me yeah sorry i'm just having visions of the wheelie bin and uh jumping into the wheelie bin which is something that i would dread too i'm doing cold showers at the moment but you know that's totally a different ball game dunking yourself into a, an ice bin but i guess with all of this this training that you're doing it sounds extremely mentally demanding physically demanding and let me just shout out to my friend jared here who i told last week that i was going to interview someone that had climbed everest and he said something like oh that would take a lot of training i said oh, i think i could do it jokingly and he said oh yeah how, how would you train for that i said i'll just go to the nearest hill and I would just climb it a thousand times until I'd climbed Everest. And he laughed. But you're telling me that you kind of did something similar, Everest. Yeah, no, absolutely. 
Yeah, it's it's actually a thing. It's it's not as physically demanding to do that. It's mentally uh, exhausting. Like every part in your brain will tell you to stop because you will be bored. You will be sick of it. And it's all about just carrying on and making yourself do that and complete that challenge. So it's not hard physically. It's really hard mentally. Mm. And you need to be ready for that. Everest is mental. It's a mental game. It's not a physical game. Mm. Yeah, I really love that. And so your training, everything that you've done to get you to this point, was Everest just a breeze for you then in the end? Because it sounds like the training was grueling. No, Everest is hard. And unlike a lot of people thinking that, oh, these days anyone can climb Everest is just tourist attraction, it's it's absolute bollocks. I don't know if you can use that word here, so apologies for this. But people very often forget that just because it's easier, it doesn't mean it's easy. And yes, it is easier to climb Everest now than it was 50 years ago. Absolutely. There's no questions about this. But by no means, it means it's easy. Whoever is on that mountain has made a massive sacrifice to their life. And and being on the mountain is exhausting. The damage that happens to your body, it's incredible. Even if you look at the strongest mountaineers, look at them before the expedition and after the expedition, you can see it on their face, how they change, because it's a huge mountain that has a, a huge influence uh, on you and your, your health and your body. So honestly, no matter what training you're going to go through, it's still going to be tough. I mean, just one thing to remember, people die of exhaustion. And and it's not just amateurs, because a lot of people say, oh, these days, if you have money, you can be dragged up the, uh, the top of Everest. A lot of people say that, but this is just absolute, that, that one, yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's not the case. Everyone has to put so much effort. No one is going to drag you to the summit. It's dangerous even. Even if there was a possibility, you can kill someone doing that. So Sherpas, they're helping enormously. I mean, the, the, the job that they do is absolutely amazing. Without Sherpas, it's, it's just almost impossible to climb a mountain because they do everything. They build the camps, they bring the oxygen, they bring the food, they cook, they do everything but they're not dragging anyone up because this is dangerous. It's a serious mountain. Imagine if someone is not feeling well and you're going to drag them up, if you, even if you, if you carry them. It's, it can kill someone. You don't do that. Everyone is there. Everyone is going through a really hard time. And yes, Sherpas will assist, but they will not drag you up. Mm. You have to do it yourself. And so I'm curious to know about the physical toll that it took on you. So I was in the mountain for two months, or actually less than that this time. So I summited on day 40, and I was kind of out of the mountain on day 43. So within that period, I lost seven kilograms. But in fact, I would say that the seven kilograms I lost, it was just the last week or so, most of it. And just to give you like a sense of, you know, how how difficult it is so i've got the garmin watch and this is not sponsored thing or anything like that it's basically it's a watch that tracks your activity and and the calories and things like that and so if i go for a run my garmin will tell me oh i lost probably 800 milliliters of water after if i run 10k for example which is quite you know it's a relatively long distance like an hour run and if I lose about seven or 800 milliliters in uh, that one run, that's quite a lot when you think about it. And I feel like it's, that is very accurate because I measured myself just to check whether it is accurate. On Everest, my Garmin told me that I lost just the summit push. I lost 13 liters of water. Now I get that. It's probably, it's so extreme that it's not going to tell me 
the accurate measurement. But if the Garmin all of a sudden tells you that you lost 13 liters of water, just the water, not the weight itself, just the water, that obviously tells you something that's very extreme. So yeah, I was visibly different before the summit push and after the summit push. You could tell that on my face. I was skinnier. My cheeks were like different. It, it takes a normal toll on your body. So yeah, it's not easy. Okay, so I guess there's going to be a point for you where you've reached all of the peaks that you've planned to reach, right? I can imagine it's going to be an incredibly emotional experience for you to sort of have ticked that box. How does someone continue to sort of push themselves through things and create new goals when it seems like the goals that you're already just about to sort of complete they're so extraordinary that I can't imagine that there's another goal that one might want to sort of aim for other than going to the bottom of the ocean or going into outer space. Oh, it, this is so easy. So basically, when you stand on top of Everest, you actually realize that this is just the tip of the iceberg. And your possibilities, first of all, are enormous, that you can do so much more. And you never run out of ideas. For someone who hasn't been thinking about Everest for a long time, Everest might be like an ult- ultimate goal. But the reality is, while climbing Everest, you meet so many people, they have so many ideas, and you just get inspired by the stories, and you come up with new sto- new ideas, and there's just possibilities are endless. And I, I don't think that just reaching the summit and seven summits is really the end of the road. I see it as a beginning, to be honest. There's just so many things now I would want to do. But obviously, um, I need time and I need money uh, because those things are not cheap and they take a long time. But there is so many things I would want to do now that I never thought of doing before. But now I know how much I'm capable of and I just want to do more. So it's not like Everest is the end goal. It's just the beginning. Yeah, I gasped when you said that because I've never heard anything so unbelievable. And I'm going to be completely honest with you right now. This has probably been the most emotional episode that I've recorded, right? I I think it's partly because everything you say is, is, it's a mixture of things, right? It's a mixture of feelings. It's so real and you're so passionate and you're so determined and... All of that just mixed together is just kind of like I had to put my hand on my heart there and just check that it was beating correctly because it's just didn't it's just it's something is just I'm feeling it right I'm feeling it well I'm glad to hear that and it's you're just so inspiring and I'm very very lucky to be here speaking with you right now um, and I just want to take this moment to thank you for you know making time in your schedule to, to do this as well. well. Well, thank you for having me. I've totally enjoyed it and I'm looking forward to hearing uh, that going live at some point. So yeah. Hopefully. Yeah. I guess, you know, there's probably no better way to wrap up the episode unless you were in the middle of telling us, you know, some fantastic story that was coming next. No, I'm, I'm sure there's plenty of more stories I could tell, but yeah, you can... Um, get in touch on my social media to live to travel and I'm sure I'll be able to share some more things with you so or you, your audience. Yeah, you're on Facebook and Instagram and TikTok at Yes. To live to travel all no spaces or underscore no or spaces. dots or anything. To live to travel. That's right. And I'm sure you uh, you've got a QA section as well as part of your um, link tree which will answer right. a lot of people's questions. But I think after listening to this, there's going to be a few people that are just going to message you just to say, wow. So what's the next immediate one? What's the next mountain you're climbing? Yeah, and how, how far away is that in time? So I'm really keen to finish the Seven Summit. So the Carson experiment is the next one on the line. However, at the moment, it's cl- the mountain is closed. So you cannot climb it this year. So I'm hoping they're going to open it next year. But if not, I'm going to the South Pole next year, December. So 
uh, it's going to be either the Carson Spearmint in Indonesia or South Pole. But South Pole will be there anyway in December. In the meantime, obviously, I'm going to do some of the Crown of Europe uh, peaks, but they are usually not as um, time consuming. Uh, so, yeah, I've got one year to prepare for the big um, climb and the South Pole. And in the meantime, I've got plenty of things going on because I'm writing a book and I'm launching my hiking clothing line. So there's plenty to do before I actually can commit to the big expedition. Everything sounds so exciting. I'm sure that, um, you know, these goals that you've also set, like writing your book and starting your clothing line, they're just an, another sort of piece of your incredible life journey to date uh and yeah it sounds extremely exciting i encourage everyone to jump onto your social media go onto your website this chat has been incredible it's been heart stopping hair raising it's been emotional we've learned about your inspirations how you started um yeah wow i got a lot more than i bargained for here and, and i'm sure everyone else did too so thank you well, thank you so much. I'm really pleased to hear that and I really enjoy that. Thank you. And look, usually to end each episode, I usually sort of get us to do a round of applause just to close it out. So on three, <laughs> one, two, three. Woo! Oh, thank, thank you. you. Awesome. Thank you, guys. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Louis Diaz podcast. To find out more about any of our guests and catch additional photos and content from this episode, find us on Instagram at Louis Diaz Podcast.